Right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar this morning. My name is Peter Sandberg, and I am the Chief Executive of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce for the UK uh, in London. Uh, we are proud to present today's uh, webinar in partnership with Swedish Chambers International uh, and Milton Public uh, Affairs. Uh, I'd say it's been a while since we hosted a webinar, um, a, a proper webinar. Uh, it feels like ages ago, but then again, my sense of time has sort of diminished uh, uh, over the last two and a half years with the pandemic. Uh, and our spring has certainly focused more on in-person uh, events. Uh, nonetheless, we're delighted to welcome you back. Uh, and I know we have participants from across Europe, from the UK, Sweden, Finland, the Baltics, the Netherlands and France, etc. So welcome to all of you. Uh, in fact, um, incidentally, the last webinar that we did host uh, was an event with The Economist, the magazine about the world in 2022. That was at the beginning of February. And uh, little did we know at that time uh, what the world would bring us, uh, even though there were some worrying signs uh, at the time. But for the event, uh, I mean, perhaps not so surprisingly, the main discussion was coming out of COVID and my, my, how things have changed. Uh, today, we dive into the war in the Ukraine and uh, the ever-changing security situation in Europe, and in particular, Sweden and Finland's decision to apply for NATO membership in May. So we ask ourselves, how did Sweden and Finland go from a clear no to saying yes to NATO? And here to help guide us today, we have a fantastic uh, panel of speakers, including former ministers, ambassadors, and security advisors, and so forth. So I really look forward to that conversation. Uh, now, for those of you who are not familiar with us, for over a century, um, the Swedish Chamber of Commerce um, for the UK has been here to support businesses and creating a platform where we do what we're doing this morning, sharing, developing, uh, and, uh, and uh, meeting. And we continue doing so with a lot of love and uh, confidence in 2022, despite everything happening uh, around us. Do have a look at some of our upcoming events as well on sec.org.uk. Today's session is all for you, uh, the participants. So let's keep it interactive. Uh, do ask questions and get involved, and we will do our best to facilitate this. If you do have any questions, uh, hopefully you're familiar with Zoom. Uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom uh, of your screen uh, and write your question and we'll try to facilitate it into the conversation. If you have any technical issues at all, please use the chat function and the SEC uh, will assist. And please note uh, that today's webinar will be recorded and made available for, um, for people on demand. I now have the great pleasure of handing over to the moderator for today's session, Elna Nikinan Andersson, uh, a Finnish native, but, um, but Swedish-based uh, journalist. Um, she's worked at Swedish television. She's worked at Lifestyle magazine Monocle, where I incidentally got my coffee this morning at the Monocle Cafe, uh, to name just a few. And as of the last three years, she is the press and cultural counselor at the Finnish embassy in Stockholm. Thank you for joining us, Elna, this morning. And over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I think just let's uh, dive in immediately. Uh, we have lots to cover. Um, as I'm sure you all know, Sweden and Finland are now in the middle of a negotiation process to join NATO. We've seen quite a quick, quick process during this past uh, spring following Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine, where both the public and the parliaments of both countries have, as our headline today states, gone from a clear no to NATO to uh, actually a decision to seek membership. And the, the process after the applications were submitted in, in May has, of course, run into some, some delays, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later as well. But nevertheless, it's been a historic six months, and today we'll be diving into uh, that change in opinion we've seen in Finland and Sweden, and the current uh, security situation, and of course, the road ahead. Let's welcome our first guests who will be speaking on the issue at hand. How did we get to the point where Finland and Sweden are applying for a NATO membership? Her Excellency, the Ambassador of Sweden to the UK, Mikaela Kumlin Granit, has been in her current position since September 2021. She has also been Ambassador to Austria and she has chaired the IAEA board. Prior to that, she was head of the unit for the European Union at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Sweden. 
and Her Excellency Maimo Henriksson, the ambassador of Finland to Sweden, has been working here at the embassy where I'm now uh, since September 2021. She's been with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs since 1989 and has been posted to both Russia and Hungary. She was previously ambassador to Norway uh, and, as I said, yes, started working here just uh, last autumn. And before that, Henriksson was head of the Foreign Ministry's East Department. Welcome both. I'd like to start with a question to you, uh, Mikaela. Uh, the Swedish Social Democrats, who are obviously the uh, party in political power right now, were very determined in their opposition to NATO membership up until somewhere early this year, even in, in January, when some would say there were already mounting concerns over, over Russia and, and uh, the security situation in Europe. What made them change their mind in the end? Uh, well, thank you so much, Elna, and thank you to the Swedish Chamber of Commerce for inviting me. And uh, also on this specific uh, subject, which is, of course, of great interest and that we're following very closely from all over the world, I must say. Uh, not least here in London, one is watching this as well very closely. And as you're indicating, of course, that the Swedish decision to uh, uh, apply for uh, NATO membership is of a magnitude never seen before in Swedish, I would say, political history, nearly. Uh, and uh, of course, to understand this, for those that don't follow Swedish policy that close, I think one needs to just also give a very short background and just rem uh, reminding everyone that uh, why this is so historical is because, of course, Sweden has conducted uh, a policy of non-alignment for over 200 years. And uh, it's in our political DNA uh, uh, and a, a very large part of our enshrined in our political souls, a political tradition, which, of course, is very much uh, enshrined in the Social Democratic Party. But I would also say in many other uh, in the public opinion's mind as well. So I think that's something that one needs to remember. Of course, we've taken incremental steps uh, during the last 200 years for closer international cooperation. And one thing that was a big step, of course, that I also think we should remind ourselves of was when Sweden joined EU in 1995, because that was one step which brought us a more from new, new, a neutral posture to a more non-aligned posture. And that's the one that we've been following now up until just, uh, well, that we're still in the process of, of looking uh, around. And uh, so uh, I think that this, uh, and this was also uh, uh, a result of the geopolitical shift uh, when uh, we had the collapse of the Soviet Union. So th these are, and this, this decision now is in, in the same thing. Uh, what changed, of course, the, the, the position of uh, the, Swedish, the Swedish public opinion, and then, of course, now the Social Democrat, uh, Democratic Party was, of course, the Russian aggression to, uh, in, in Ukraine and the invasion of Ukraine. And it was not only the fact that uh, uh, this uh, this um, uh, action, this, this action uh, the, the 24th of February was completely a challenge to everything we've seen earlier on when it comes to challenging the European security order and so forth. But it was also the the art of the invasion or the uh, of the uh, aggression, the brutality, uh, the systematic and structural force of this uh, aggression. And it was also quite clear that uh, um, it was one thing to be uh, supported by uh, NATO, NATO members, which one does with partners, but something di completely different uh, when it, you look at Article 5, because uh, NATO does defend allies, but only supports partners. So I think that was something. And of course, I would also say that the trigger in all this, and that's why my Finnish colleague should maybe have started, was, of course, the Finnish very kind of clear intention quite early on on uh, that this was something, the, the, an application to NATO was quite uh, something that one was looking on. And this was, that, so we draw the conclusion that, of course, in this new situation, uh, the Swedish security was best served by also uh, trying to apply for uh, NATO membership. Uh, Finland is an extremely close partner. We are security policy twins. So I think that's something also. So all these together uh, gave us the conclusion that joining NATO would now be the right thing to do, given the new circumstances. And also, of course, that we feel that we have something to co contribute to as well. I think that's something I would like also to elaborate on eventually. Hmm. 
Yes, um, we'll come back to you, Michaela, later uh, mm -hmm. with some more questions. But let's go over to Maimo Hendrickson now. Uh, Maimo, what's your view on the develop developments this spring regarding the shift in, in uh, Finland's and Sweden's positions on, on NATO? No. Th thank you, Elna. Yes, it's indeed been a very uh, extreme spring in, in many respects. And, and one wish that things wouldn't have started to uh, develop in uh, the background with, with a war in the background, the war in Ukraine, uh, which we follow daily and, and which is a kind of a like a dark shadow over all of us and uh, doesn't look, look too, too uh, optimistic uh, currently. So, so let's, let, let's hope that uh, that uh, situation could be ended in some way to the advantage of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, indeed, uh, the 24th of February changed things very much in Finland. And in fact, already uh, it started to change in the upcoming months as uh, we could uh, see how uh, Russia uh, again returned its soldiers to the Ukrainian border. And, and there were uh, big worries in Finland in December and January. And, and then they materialized then uh, with the Russian invasion on the 24th of February. And then the reactions in Finland were very strong. Uh, and I think that one reason why the reactions in Finland were strong was that we could so very much relate to our own wars, especially maybe to the winter war, because then that, that was started by a staged attack by Russia. And now when the Ukraine war was about to start, Russia clearly was fishing after a, a similar situation in order to be able to accuse Ukraine uh, for starting the war. And, and I think the US intelligence was very smart in making public these Russian events uh, uh, ahead of the war and thus kind of uh, pulling the market, uh, the ma carpet uh, from under Russia. So Russia never managed to uh, stage such a kind of fake Ukraine attack. And then they simply just started the war without that. Uh, but the Finns were very, very much uh, touched by what, what happened. And we had the quick change in opinions. Uh, for the past 10 years, we have had about 20% uh, who have been in favor of NATO membership, about 50% have been against, and 30% have not known uh, what opinion to take. And now there was a complete switch, uh, change of opinion. So after a couple of weeks only, uh, we had uh, more than 50% of Finns being in favor of joining NATO, uh, about, uh, in fact, less than 20% being against it, and 30% still uh, with the I don't know opinion. Uh, so uh, this uh, change took place quicker and stronger than in Sweden. And I think the reason to this is our war experience, our historical experiences as neighbor to Russia. And then of course, our long neighbor, uh, our long border that we have with Russia, we are so close to Russia. And I would say that after the Russian invasion to Ukraine, the Finns did not get scared. It's not a question about that, but we got uh, shocked about having, about realizing that we have a neighbor who acts in this way, a neighbor that attacks its other friendly neighbor, in fact, also brotherhood people. And uh, to kind of realize that this is the fact, this is now reality, made Finns to think that if this happens, then anything could happen. And then we need to seek some shelter. And what shelter is there? There is no 100% shelter, nothing that would really be the 100% guarantee. But as our president very well phrased it, NATO is the best uh, option we can have, the best alternative to have, have some shelter. And, and this, I think, certainly uh, was uh, the reason why uh, we got along with our processes. The strong public opinion, which then put the parties into movement, uh, the government and the president. And, and uh, uh, Michaela used a very good term, I think, security policy twins. Then very quickly the goal started to synchronize as much as possible, first of all, with the goal to land in the same position, Sweden and Finland, and then also to have the time-wise uh, synchronization. 
But even if uh, the country's uh, security policy twins, there have been some differences in the public uh, debate. Uh, uh, how would you characterize that, Maimo? Uh, how has the Finnish debate been and what have the differences been in comparison with Sweden? Uh, that's a very good uh, question, in fact, and, and that has been very, very interesting to follow now during this spring when, when one has had the opportunity to follow the debate in, the, in, in both countries. Uh, one clear difference has been the feeling of urgency. In Finland, there has been a strong feeling of urgency that we need, uh, needed to file in uh, if we ended up with that conclusion. Then we needed to act quickly and quickly find, file in uh, an application for NATO membership because uh, it was seen that every week uh, adds the risks, the risks of Russia being able to prepare for some ugly things to do better uh, and also the risk of just something else happening in the world, which, which would have made it impossible to file in an application. Something big would have happened. We have the French elections, for instance. Maybe there would have been a result that would have caused suddenly very big problems. But one could even argue now, uh, in, in hindsight, that uh, maybe we should even have been a little bit quicker uh, Turkey wouldn't have maybe woken up as it did because they did it very, very late. So this uh, feeling of urgency, uh, I never found in Sweden. Instead, there was very much the opposite because the most commonly asked question has been, why be in such a hurry? Isn't it better to kind of uh, think things over a little bit, maybe get back to the issue in the autumn? Uh, and also, uh, somehow I understand that because Mikhail Anders uh, just very well described the identity issue and the 200 years of, of neutrality. So in such, with such a background, it's not easy to, to take very quick decisions. Then Mikaela, another, uh, you, yeah. if I may interrupt you there, Maimo. Yeah. Mikaela, uh, go, going back to you, do, do you agree with, uh, with Maimo's description there of the differences between Finland and Sweden in, in the debate? Yes, I think she uh, actually she's quite spot on. And of course, I'm not sitting in the same way in, in Helsinki or in Finland as mine was sitting in Stockholm, but I do spend a lot of time in Finland. And I was actually in, uh, in Finland, out in the archipelago during the, this Easter. And there I really felt, when we were talking to people, that um, what Maima was kind of alluding to, that the difference also is that in Sweden, we always have this. We have to ask questions. We have to always, you know, be very... We, you know, we're always questioning things when they go too quick and so forth. And is it done in the right way? But there's another sense, my, this is personal, but it's very sense of pragmatism in the Finnish way of thinking. And the way that all my, my friends and relatives out in this archipelago island, they were from all walks of life and all political parties and so forth. And they were all very intent on the importance of moving together, uh, in, in tandem and so forth. And we don't really have that kind of culture in Sweden either. Uh, so I think that uh, Maimo really describes that in a good way. And also I would again also say that it is very much dependent on our different historical backgrounds and also um, geopolitical, of course, positioning and so forth. Uh, so even though we're very close in very many sense that those small things, but they're not big things that are big differences. And I think that we should also always underline the importance of us walking together on these issues as well. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, we also have another sit we also have another situation here that might have played a role. We have upcoming elections and so forth, and of course, that has also uh, you know made things a bit more maybe complicated in in, in Sweden. Mm. You mentioned the elections. How do you see that uh, affecting this this situation with NATO? And now that we are actually you know the the process is dragging on on a little bit because of, of Turkey. Well, so far, it seems that, uh, I mean, the fact that uh, this issue now, the decision was taken to uh, apply for membership, that issue is not the issue anymore, you know, in the upcoming debate uh, for the elections. There's no issue whether or, where, whether or we should yeah. apply or not. I mean, we, are, we have now sent in our application. This is what we're working towards and so forth. So... I think that that issue is kind of off the table for the elections. But we'll, we, of course, have to see what happens now, uh, you know, in uh, this interim phase and uh, also uh, what kind of other effects that this might have 
Uh, and of course, uh, it has to do with personalities. If we have, uh, of course, an election where we have a change of government and so forth. So there are many of those things. But I think the issue whether or not we should have applied, that one is already settled in some sense. There might be some after debate and so forth and how things were handled. But for now, uh, we don't really, I don't really see that as, uh, you know, a change. Uh, in, mm. in, uh, There's no going the, back the from issue. that. It's still the cost of living and the economics that is very difficult right now. Yeah. Um, I have to ask about uh, what everyone is, of course, uh, interested in Turkey. Uh, how do you, you both, Maimo and Mikaela, see this situation developing and any views on when it might be resolved? Let's start with you, Mikaela. Uh, well, um, well, let's say that uh, I think it's very important to uh, uh, remember, and I also think that we have made this clear, that Turkey is an extremely important NATO partner. And uh, we have, of course, we take we have taken uh, Turkey's security concerns quite, you know, seriously. I think that's something that we we have to say, and that we also believe. I think we were a bit surprised that uh, these concerns didn't weren't um, uh, flagged for earlier on, but where are we are where we are. Uh, we are very intent on uh, trying to resolve these issues, and we are working very closely with both our Finnish colleagues, but also with NATO and also with the Turks and Turkey. Uh, in trying to advance uh, the issues and the negotiations and also how to also meet up with these concerns that have been discussed. So this is a process that is ongoing, a quite intense one. And of course, we hope that we'll be able to resolve these issues as soon as possible. Um, and we have also uh, made that quite clear. We're also looking at ways of doing that in very concrete terms. So we'll see where we go. And we hope that this uh, will land quite quickly. And we would hope this to be finished, finalized before this Madrid summit. But uh, we're, we're working as fast as we can on this. Mm -hmm. And Maimo, your, your view on the situation with, with Turkey and um, the applications? No, we were, of course, surprised. We were surprised because of two, two reasons maybe. First of all, the, uh, Turkey had signaled very clearly to Finland uh, that they see no obstacles to Finland and, and Sweden joining NATO. Our president uh, Niinistö has uh, informed uh, publicly uh, that President Erdogan in April said that Turkey will assess favorably uh, joining of NATO of our two countries. Uh, so so where, when when you get such messages, it's very difficult to imagine that there would be another opposite message then a couple of weeks later on. So, so surprised by this and also maybe surprised uh, what comes to the Turkish demands because uh, Finland has been looking at those, uh, for instance, uh, terrorism uh, demands and Finnish legislation is in line with uh, NATO countries legislation in average. So, so they can, of course, not be different criteria for applicant countries than there are, or let's say harder criteria for applicant countries than there are for those countries who are already in NATO. Uh, um, but of course, I mean, uh, at the same time, Finland has said that we naturally have to take uh, Turkey's uh, messages uh, seriously and we have to have a dialogue with Turkey and that's what we very much want to have. And we are optimistic that the issue can be solved and we of course hope that it can be solved uh, in a near future. Um, I have one question from the from the audience here. Um, how would Finland react if the Swedish NATO application and the uh, current complications with securing uh, securing support from all NATO countries turn into a very prolonged process? Would Finland go ahead with their own application, and how would Sweden react to such a scenario? We can start with you, given uh, Maimo that you're you're already sort of there prepared. Uh, we are doing this together with Sweden. Uh, I again quote Mikaela, we are security policy twins. And in fact, again, there are two reasons. First of all, we want to be a good friend uh, with Sweden. We have done this process together. We filed in the applications precisely at the same moment uh, to Secretary General Stoltenberg in NATO headquarters on the 18th of, of May. Uh, so we want to, be, want to be a good friend and mate to Sweden. But there's also another reason, and that is a selfish reason. Uh, for Finnish security, is it, a, it is, of course, very important that also Sweden is on board, because otherwise Finland would be like a strange island, NATO island, because of our geographical location. 
defense needs deepness. That's also what the Ukrainian, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine has shown. Uh, you need kind of to fill in uh, with uh, reserve troops, uh, reserve weapons, and so on. You need to have kind of the reserve space behind you. And without Sweden, we wouldn't have that. So from a defense point of view, it's also very important that we uh, join together. And Michaela, your, your comment on that question. Yes, I think that um, uh, we, we see very much eye to eye on that as well. And uh, as I want to also pick up what Maimo said that uh, I think also for NATO, uh, what we bring together to get, uh, what we bring into NATO together as two, as re is really what Naimo said. It's a de it's a the coherence of uh, uh, what uh, uh, NATO receives here in the Baltic Sea region, and also the the the, 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 the also the um, the deepness and, and so forth. So uh, it's also something that I think NATO would win much on. And again, uh, for us, uh, it's extremely important to go hand in hand with Finland, uh, also for our own uh, security. And also because we're so, we so we have a very, very, very close cooperation there. And it would be very difficult for either of us, or at least for us to, to keep that up if one of us would be in a not so. So we don't really see that as an alternative either for, from our side either. Mm. I have one more question from the audience, and I think this is uh, for you, Michaela. Um, how will the Swedish NATO membership affect the country's international military activities? Is it possible that Sweden becoming a NATO member will increase instability in other parts of the world? I'm mostly thinking of the work Sweden do at the border between North and South Korea under the umbrella of the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission. But Swedish military is also helping in other parts of the world. So Sweden's international military activities, yeah. how would they be uh, possibly uh, affected by a membership? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, good question. And this is, of course, one of the questions that has been debated also in the internal uh, debate in Sweden. And I think that our conclusion that we've drawn there is that you can actually be uh, keep your uh, uh, foreign policy engagement and activities, uh, even if you uh, join uh, NATO. And I think that one great example of that is actually Norway, who has a very kind of high profile in many international issues and so forth. Uh, so I think that I would turn it around and say that uh, the same kind of engagement and uh, international solidarity that Sweden wants to uh, have and show on a global stage, we will bring that with us in to NATO, the same kind of enthusiasm that we have within the UN, for instance, or the EU. So I think this is just something that actually will add on to our, our, our wish to contribute to international uh, and European security. All right, I think uh, we have to let uh, the two ambassadors go. They have other engagements to attend to. Huge thank you for joining us uh, this morning. I'm so glad that we got to ask you some audience questions as well. Have a good weekend, both of you, and uh, you. we will continue with our program here. So, um, while well, other Nordic Hi, countries, Mama. yes, allow, allow you to say goodbye as well. So while other Nordic countries like uh, Norway, Denmark and Iceland have been members of the NATO alliance for quite some time, Sweden and Finland uh, did not join the pact for historic and geopolitical reasons. However, since the 24th of February, everything changed and the, in the uh, aftermath of a dramatic evolution in European security sparked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Decades of non-alignment are coming to an end. The headline for our next keynote is where are we standing now in the security situation in Sweden and Finland. And here to speak to us on the subject, we have Johan Viktorin, Executive Intelligence Advisor and co-founder of Intel. For several years, Johan has run his own company with focus on helping managements and boards to strengthen their safety work. He has extensive experience in mapping threats and trends in cybercrime. Johan also has a military background and was, among other things, a driving force in the creation of the 31st Airborne Battalion and the National Intelligence Unit in Sweden. He's also the Nordic Baltic Region Chair for the nonprofit organization Strategic Competitive Intelligence Professionals. Welcome, Johan. 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elna. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to speak to you here. Unfortunately, Mina, my co-founder, was uh, had to rush to a client. There is a lot of demand for political risk in due diligence nowadays. But so how, the short answer when it comes to uh, the security situation in Sweden and Finland the next few years is that it's a very good situation. And I will walk you through that uh, according to my analysis of this. Um, the Swedish and Finnish armed forces are constantly upgrading their capabilities, most notably the acquirement of uh, the F-35 fighter from the US, which will be a vast improvement and also be a good mix when it comes to different kind of aircraft in, in the portfolio of, of the Nordic countries. Um, <clears throat> The Finnish army is one of the European best armies uh, with a huge artillery force in the European comparison. It's a very good air force and it's a very qualitative, though it lacks uh, some capabilities in the Navy sphere or the Marines, uh, maritime sphere. Uh, the Swedish Ar uh, armed forces consists of a very ec rather excellent air force with a whole system, a very qualitative, good uh, Navy with submarines but a tiny army uh, with the exception of that they have capability to fight with tanks in the Arctic region, which is very good. So that is uh, uh, a good starting point. That is also enhanced by the bridging defense assurances by major uh, NATO states, such as US, UK and France, to name a few. And we've seen a, a, a conscious um, work from both Swedish and Finnish side the last five years to improve bilateral uh, relations with all these uh, states, also forming and integrating into initiatives such as the Joint Expeditionary Force, to name one uh, a regional um, multilateral um, cooperation. Uh, the government's also committed to uh, increasing the defense budget to 2%. So that is really looking good the next few years, because that has, of course, to do with the status of the Russian armed forces. The Russian arm, uh, armed forces is mainly a continental power reflection. So it has a huge army with enormous amount of artillery munitions, as we can see in, in Ukraine unfortunately, um, but uh, now they don't have that capability in our immediate neighborhood. So we see the elite guard division, uh, the 76th division in Pskov, uh, east of uh, Estonia, is melting away in Ukraine because of mismanagement. Uh, the status of the Russian Air Force and the Baltic uh, Sea Navy is not that impressive. Uh, and should have not been, uh, uh, if not the uh, war in Ukraine also broke out, so to say. So that is that is very unlikely to happen any large conventional military operation from a Russian capability uh, that could affect uh, Sweden and Finland. But as we have seen in Ukraine, our rationality is not the Russian rationality. So I would not like to exclude things as raids or even um, a kind of um, covert or covert attack trying to uh, um, obscurate where it comes from with a kind of missile or some kind of provocation uh, in order to just destabilize the situation. On other arenas, though, the Russians have capabilities, most notably in the cyber uh, arena. And they have tried to do a lot of attacks during the war of Ukraine. And a lot of that is not publicly known because it's very hard for journalists to, to dig into that kind of uh, activities. We know that uh, the Russians tried to attack the Viasat, the satellite systems for communication, that uh, was sold in cooperation with major Western powers. And the Russians also had the opportunity to, to use subversion and sabotage. Uh, and that 
hook, is hooking into this with a rationality. So we have to be on our watch, uh, even though the conventional capability is low at the moment. Uh, looking a little bit further ahead, we have um, in the Swedish uh, internal politics, we have for the moment a fragile government and unfortunately internal Swedish politics has been mixed with security politics as you, some of you already know where the the government, uh, sorry, rather the Social Democrat Party, which is the party that forms the government, but it's the party that has a, um, a contract or agreement with a um, former uh, left parties who left the left party. And uh, she is from uh, Kur uh, Kurdistan or she's from, <laughs> she's Kurdish and, and has a quite strong voice against Turkey. So that is a very unfortunate at the moment, but that, that will pass as soon as the election in September has uh, uh, been done uh, because then she's out of the, uh, of the parliament. Uh, there are also some voices in the, uh, both countries, Sweden and Finland. In Sweden, it's quite weak, I think. It's a kind of cultural personality saying that we should wait and see why do we do this now? But uh, as Michaela said earlier, it's done and the government will not sh uh, change any direction at all. In Finland, it's a little bit more, uh, a few voices in the security policy elite that has come through with an, an ballooning ideas such as we might go uh, alone, uh, we'll be forced to go alone in this application if there's trouble with Sweden, Turkey. Uh, and however tempting that might be from one perspective, as the ambassadors clearly stated that it would be strategic, very risky because it would likely increase the risk that other nations in, uh, in NATO, in the southeastern part of NATO, southern part of NATO, start to question how should we defend this 1300 kilometers border without access or without clear access to Swedish waters and, and air, airspace. That would be uh, to, to introduce a higher level of uns, uh, insecurity in that regard. And for Sweden, that would mean that Sweden would be an object, uh, a very, very uh, precious object for the Russian in, uh, Russians in order to in, in the beginning of hostilities to try to seize or scare Sweden from letting or supporting any defense of Finland. So that is totally the same view as the ambassadors had in this regard. Other things that might complicate uh, the situations further on from a security perspective is that the midterm ele elections in in the uh, US would probably weaken the Democratic Party and that could affect the presidential elections uh, in 2024. And that also goes with that President Xi yesterday just reaffirmed the so-called no limit cooperation with Russia. So there are several uncertainties when it comes to the, the major powers in what kind of direction and what will happen uh, in the next few years. So I think I stop there. I think you can hear me now. Yes. Thank you, Johan, for that. Um, very interesting and, and very reassuring, of course, to hear that the security situation, despite all the, the uh, uh, all, all that's going on, is good in, in Finland and Sweden. Um, I'm interested in this period that we are in, in now, this period between uh, uh, submitting an application and then becoming a, a member of NATO. Previously, it was often talked about that this would be a risky period, uh, maybe even a dangerous period. Uh, and now it seems to be getting slightly longer than, than we initially thought. Uh, but on the other hand, we haven't seen much uh, activity to, from Russia uh, that I at least is know of. What, what's your view, view on this? No, as I said, I think that, that the 
defense assurances from first most US, of course, but also UK and uh, France is very reassuring. Um, and combined with the lack of capabilities in the Russian armed forces in this neighborhood in, in order to um, com commence uh, major military operations. But of course, as I said, they have not our rationality. And you could hypothesize uh, that you try to introduce something that would be another uh, troubling spot uh, for the uh, for the accession to NATO, such as provoking any kind of border incident with Finland, for example, uh, or, or small islands in the in the southeast of Finland. Uh, so, so that kind of raid things or, or provocations, we cannot exclude that, and that could complicate things. And that's why this is not very good, that this bazaaring from President Erdogan is, is going on uh, at the moment, because suddenly you are in 2024 uh, and you have the US presidential election. That is uh, an uncertainty that, is, uh, that we have to consider moving forward. Mm, so it's quite important that this would be resolved quickly. Before 2024. Mm. Um, I know that you have yourself gone from being against the Swedish NATO membership to, to actually being in favor of it. Uh, how was your thought process there? Yeah, it was very simple because I connected that to the strategic twins. So I'm very affected by the, the Finnish situation. And that was the same as it was in the late 40s when NATO was formed. When it was a discussion, it was a Swedish initiative to, uh, to form a Scandinavian defense union. Uh, and Norway and Denmark, due to their experiences during the Second World War, chose NATO. And Sweden, the... the, the um, the thinking in the Swedish government then was that if we uh, join NATO, which we could, what will happen to Finland? And that was not only um, altruistic uh, regarding Finland, it was also very egoistic. So the reasoning was this, that, that uh, the Soviet Union, you have to remember that the state of co in Czechoslovakia in 48, and they had not demobilized their army after the Second World War. So they had uh, uh, a force that was that had a bloody nose in Finland in 39-40, but marched into B Berlin in 1945, was very experienced in managing war in 1945 in the late 40s. So the, the reasoning then were, if we go to uh, NATO, then the risk is too high that the Russians will, or the Soviets will attack Finland and invade that. And suddenly we will have Soviet forces up at Torne Elv or on, on Åland. And what good does that make Swedish security? So that was why we chose that position and underline that with the strong defense and so on that we really had during these years. And so this is the same. So now when, when Russia attacks the Ukraine and, and the, the risk for war in Europe goes up, Finland is very exposed and have to choose their way. And we have to support that for their sake, but also for our own sake. So we are really strategic twins. Right. Thank you, Johan. Um, stay on, on the line. We'll come back to you uh, in the end when we have a, a general Q&A. Thanks for now. Thanks. So let's move, move on to our final segment. Um, for a long time, Sweden and Finland clearly stated that there was not a majority among the people or in the parliaments for uh, supporting a NATO membership. But today, opinion polls show a majority of both Swedes and Finns for joining NATO and most uh, elected politicians, both those in power and those in opposition, have also changed their minds. How did that happen? Um, our speakers are both seasoned professionals from the fields of politics in Sweden and Finland. Stefan Wallin was the Minister of Defence in Finland between 2011 and 2012. He has a long political career behind him as a member of parliament and party leader for the Swedish People's Party in Finland. Niklas Nordström is the former mayor of Luleå and chairman of Business Sweden. Niklas has a broad background with experience in both business and politics. He's been the chairman of the Social Democrats Youth Organization and in 2016 he was chosen as the Swedish politician of the year. Welcome both. Uh, Stefan, uh, 
would you like to start? Um, how did politicians and people go from a no to a yes to NATO? And why also was the shift uh, so much quicker in Finland than in, in Sweden, in, in your opinion? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much and good, good morning also from Helsinki, Helsinki Force. Um, jolly good question, of course. And I think the, the question of how, how on earth did the Finnish, usually very stiff Finnish uh, public and political opinion uh, about NATO change so quickly in favor of that membership, that will be an object for a lot of research in the, in the future. It was, it was not from, from zero to 100, but literally from about 20, 25 to 75% in just a few weeks when we talk about the, the public opinion. And this after having been about 20, 25% in favor for 25 years. So it all happened very rapidly. The, the official Finnish political opinion expressed by, in fact, several governments over the last 20, 25 years concerning NATO was for a long time, in a nutshell, something that you could call uh, readiness for the, for the possible but unlikely. It was often called the NATO option. But I think the more correct uh, expression would have been possibility to request for membership because option sounds like something that just happens when you pull a string and as we now know Finland and Sweden uh, it was not that easy this, this Finnish readiness the official one has been expressed so as I said by many governments uh, in their reports on foreign and security policy and the, the newest one is from 2020 and just some, some sticks, stick words from, from that one, quote, maintaining a national room to maneuver, freedom of choice, option of joining a military alliance and applying for main membership. And also the decisions are always considered in the real time, taking account of the changes in the international security government. End of quote, that was the official uh, statements by the governments. I think that many politicians in Finland thought, and some, of course, even hoped, uh, that they will never have to go from this uh, just quote of theory to, to practice. And we have to remember that before this spring, only two out of nine parties in the parliament were officially in favor of NATO membership. The coalition party, the conservatives, if you want, and the Swedish People's Party, which is a liberal uh, party. All others were more or less against. But the change started, I think, in December when, when Putin and his spokespersons started to draw red lines to forbid NATO to, to expand anymore. They started to write letters to EU countries in order to divide and rule. That was the starting point for the change in the Finnish NATO opinion. Because it seemed that Russia was trying to limit Finland's and Sweden's, of course, sovereign countries, freedom of choice, our possibilities to make our own decisions as far as our uh, security policy is concerned. And then, of course, came the February 24th, and that changed it, changed it all and in real time. Finns who still remember Stalin's attack on Finland in November 1939, we have during the, all these decades, post-war decades, tried to keep up good working relations with Russia, to cope with the Kremlin, even with Putin, we have tried to stand, even understand them. But now we suddenly felt, like all others, of course, betrayed after Russia's coward attack against Ukraine, a non-aligned country. And the logical question in Finland, of course, like Maimo Hendrickson previously said, was we have this 1,340 1, kilometer common border with Russia was, uh, is Finland next in line? Putin had also lied to the Finnish political leadership about, about its, its aims. And President Tsaulinin is to said on the morning after the attack to the Finnish public, quote, the masks have been taken off. Now we can only see the cold face of war, end of quote. And that expressed quite well what many Finns felt that morning. Disappointment, 
yes, sorrow, anger, maybe some fear also. But uh, foremost, a boosted self-confidence over our own freedom of choice. Now, we will do what is needed to maximize our own national security interest. And what Russia thinks about that, it doesn't matter anymore. We have tried to, to, to uh, pay attention to, to Russia while defining our, our NATO relationship over the years, but now it didn't matter anymore. Because for Russia, the only thing that mattered, as we saw, was their own imperialism based on the management of fear, a narrative of lies, and a strategy of violence. And then something interesting, of course, happened. Uh, the public opinion and also the po political opinion. Up to the beginning of this year, uh, as I said, Finnish public opinion has been almost anemic when it came to, to NATO. About 20-25% in favor, about 50% against. And uh, one reason for this was that also the, the political leadership had an anemic NATO opinion. But on February 24th, this changed. The first poll after the attack was published only four days after the, the attack, and it showed that 53% suddenly were in favor of the leadership. And the following polls showed the same trend. It went up to over 75%. Many, including me also, to be, to be honest, <clears throat> had thought that a clear pro NATO signal from the political leadership when the time was right was needed, required for the, the, the public NATO opinion would start to move in the same direction. But what happened now was that the, the public was the first to react even before the leadership did. And uh, you say that the people took over the, the overtaking file. Um, when polls soon showed that 60 and even 70% are pro-NATO, that the supporters of all parties, including the leftist one, uh, were pro. It was very easy for the leadership, the political leadership, and that is the government and the president, who according to the constitution of Finland, are in charge of, of foreign and security policy. Easy for them to take over the steering wheel. At the same time, the same orientation, of course, was in full speed in Sweden, and that was very important and very helpful also for the Finnish politicians. And Nicholas will soon tell us more about that process. And of course, the rest is history. The Finnish parliament voted eventually in favor of NATO with the vote 188 against 8. That was almost a North Korean figure, a historical one, but it was a, a sign of Finnish pragmatism when it when it at its best. So just to, to uh, end up, despite a long time anemic NATO opinion amongst the Finns, there's been under the surface all the time a kind of latent, bubbling readiness to, to rethink if something happens. Needed was only reason, motive, a window for this one opportunity. And, and uh, to conclude, Vladimir Putin delivered it all to the Finns on February 24th. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Stefan. Very, very interesting to, to hear you describe the process there. And we'll come back to you later with some, some questions. But I think we'll let uh, Niklas uh, Nordström in here to, to tell us his view, uh, his take on this. Uh, Niklas, welcome. Thank you. And I think you at this moment understand how strong connected uh, Finland and Sweden are together. And what I will tell you about is no exemption. This will show very clearly how Finland had a huge effect on the Swedish decision. If you go back to the when the Second World War ended, uh, there was a possibility for Sweden to also be part of NATO. There was an idea about the Nordic Defense Alliance, but both Norway and Denmark moved to NATO. And by that point, uh, it wasn't possible for Finland to, to make that move. So in a solidarity with, um, with Finland, uh, Sweden also said no to NATO by that time. 
So when we look upon that decision, that was a, a decision made of, of pragmatic and solidarity. But over the years, especially for the social democrats, but also Sweden overall, that position of being a pragmatic man moved into be more of an ideologic decision that we should be free from military alliances. And that has been a very strong mantra, especially for leading social democrats, but also for, for many other voices in the political uh, field and and for an international issues field. So it wasn't that easy for Sweden to turn when the time now came up. As late as in the end of January, the Swedish parliament, Riksdagen, had a debate concerning the, the foreign policy and the, the security declaration. And at that point, it was extremely clear stated in the decision that Sweden should not uh, be a NATO country, we should not apply. Over the years, you have seen that there has been a movement from different parties towards NATO. Uh, many, many voices on the right side from the Conservative Party Moderaterna has been clear in uh, NATO membership. But you have to remember that their decision wasn't easy either. The foreign prime minister and foreign minister, Mr. Carl Bildt, he was against NATO. And it was until after he uh, resigned as leader for the moderate party, they could take a decision on NATO. Up to that time, it wasn't possible. You have had other parties like the Liberal Party, and the Christian Democrats, and also later the center party that has moved into the column of saying yes to NATO. But it has taken steps for those different parties. When you then ended up, as Stefan described, this situation with the war, remember then that in the end of January, it was clear stated that it said in, in the declaration from the, from the parliament that we shouldn't apply for NATO. So when the war then came, it started a debate quite intense in Sweden, and the eyes were all the time on what is Finland doing? What is Finland saying? Because that was extremely important. And I've said in my analysis to, to clients and, and in other circumstances that when people have complained about the, that Sweden has been slower than Finland, Sweden haven't kept pace with Finland. And I've said all the time that this is not so so strange because remember the historic situation we did our decision then after the second world war depending on finland's position it isn't strange now that it is the Finns that have uh, the first movers advantage and we need to listen to them and follow them and so all happened so you had a movement then starting and the parties that had the clear, yes, they of course pushed uh, more aggressively that we need to move forward and we need to apply for membership. And from the beginning, even after the war, uh, the prime minister Andersson and other leading social democrats were very clear that no, this is not the case. We will not move into a NATO membership. Uh, that, that, uh, that position we have is still a strong one. But you could see that uh, that base of on the foundation for this now more an ideological uh, standpoint started to 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 crack up and started to rumble. Uh, the defense minister in Sweden he has made a move during his term as. As, for, as Minister of Defense, of signing bilateral agreements with many countries, for example, with the United Kingdom. So when you remember uh, what, what, uh, what has been said earlier about this very uh, near and close uh, cooperation with Finland when it comes to the military, then Sweden had signed those bilateral agreements with a lot of countries. So that was a way of handling that we're not moving into NATO, but we still understand that Russia is a big threat. So it was a way from, from, the, from, uh, from the defense minister Hultqvist to sign those agreements. For him, it was very tough. He had said on the Social Democratic Congress in November 
that in a very strong speech that will never happen, especially when he is Minister of Defense, it will never happen that we join NATO. So you can understand the difficulty for the government and the, for the leading social democrats to move from that very, very strong standpoint from, from the internal uh, forest congresses to the parliament decision and also then in, in the public opinion. So they had a tough time of changing. What went under the radar, for example, was that the Sweden Democrats, they are quite a huge party in the parliament. It's almost one fifth of the of, of, of the representatives in, in the parliament. Uh, they took a decision. They have historically been against any international collaboration, European Union and so on. So of course, also they had a standpoint against NATO. But under the radar, they made a very quick decision and, and quickly changed uh, their view. Um, so it was more or less up to now how the social Dems would do it. Uh, the moderate party leader, he was out aggressively pushing and saying that if we win election in September, the moderates will push through a NATO membership, even if the social Dems doesn't want that. So it was quite tense also in the political uh, community. But all the time, the eyes were on Finland. What are they doing? In the end of March, you, can, you could, when you, when you are... Uh, uh, when, when you are the kind of, of person that uh, can feel the sentiment of where the debate is going, you could see that there is a shift and we will uh, most likely apply for NATO membership, but it will take some time. The Social Dems started an internal process uh, to listen to, to their uh, active uh, districts and hear what they were saying. And that process went on uh, during uh, if you say end of April, beginning of March, uh, of May. And that process was kind of a way to help the Social Democrats to turn this very strong position in turning the, the ideological position when it comes to NATO into a more pragmatic one. So it was kind of a transformation, transaction period. As Stefan said, I was also astonished of the public opinion in Sweden. Uh, because that shifted also. You could see a stronger move in opinion in favor of NATO, going from a very clear yes, uh, a clear, very clear no, up till a, a clear yes. Uh, so when you then end up in May, then you also saw that suddenly the, the wheels were, were connected together with Sweden and Finland. It was very clear that the discussion between the two countries now were in total sync. So decisions and the steps were made together so that we had in the middle of May, when the Finnish president was with, visiting Sweden, the both countries had made their processes and the decisions were clear. In the Swedish parliament, it was so that in the end, it was the Green Party and the left party that didn't follow uh, with the others. As Stefan said, it was a very clear majority also in Sweden, almost 90% of the members of parliament voted to apply for a NATO membership. So that process uh, we had in Sweden, uh, it was more, more of changing this ideological position uh, that it had ended up be, being over the years into this more pragmatic one. And when you listen to the Swedish politicians, especially the social Dems that are in government, they have been, of course, interviewed and asked what you have said this, this earlier, and you said that earlier. And they all have pointed to the Russia invasion of Ukraine and Finland. With the new security situation uh, we have at our borders, and when our most important ally, uh, our, our friend Finland moved, then Sweden had to move. One number that struck me extremely was that uh, the, the, in Finland you have a, a Swedish-speaking uh, newspaper, Huvudstadsbladet, uh, that made a poll among Swedes, and this is overall Swedes. Six out of ten Swedes said, I'm ready to take arms to go out to defend Finland. Sometimes I have been thinking where we are heading with the Nordic issues and is it really something that the, the normal people are connected to? That number, I think, says a lot. Uh, the, the Swedes see Finland 
as an, an extremely important uh, neighbor and someone we are ready to defend, even if it needs to take arms to do that. Right. Uh, thank you, Niklas, for that. And um, I think it's time for questions again. We, we do have quite a few questions from the audience here. And um, I'd like to go uh, perhaps back to Johan first here. Um, the question is, um, how will Sweden's security related financial obligations change once it becomes a member of NATO? And are there particular areas where Sweden does meet requirements and other areas where it doesn't and will need to increase investment? So Johan, for you. All right, so the, the government has uh, committed themselves to, and all political parties, even the left party and the, the Green Party have committed themselves to 2% of the GDP. That might be somewhere uh, 2025 to 2028. They are still debating that number uh, that year uh, when that will be taking place. So when it comes to requirements, I think that we have to wait a little bit what the NATO defense planning says, because we have to integrate our own defense planning into NATO's defense planning. And that means because every country must defend itself, of course, but there is also an overarching defense planning and that will affect where you invest. But uh, there are very uh, strong capabilities that could deploy it for NATO beneficial uh, use uh, quite early on. For example, the Swedish SIGINT capability I don't know if you have noted that, but uh, along the Polish eastern uh, border that patrols Swedish SIGINT aircraft regularly uh, during the spring now in order to collect information regarding Russian forces, of course, etc. And that would now be deeper into Russian territory. And that is a, a, a crucial capability that Sweden brings to the table. And I also saw in, in the chat, or it was in the Q&A, about um, Sweden bringing in uh, troops into the Baltic countries, etc. And that might also happen. Uh, the Swedish Supreme Commander was out in the radio a couple of days ago speaking about that we could be more offensive in that regard. And that is trying to, to move the mental preparedness for Swedish public to see Swedish troops in the Baltic countries. So they're paving the way. Thank you. And another question, I think this might be uh, good for Stefan at least. Uh, how do you think uh, the stiff Ukrainian resistance in halting the Russian invasion is affecting Finnish and Swedish defense politics? Would it have been different if Russia had managed to invade Ukraine much further? Yeah, that's a good question, of course. <clears throat> I think the... The Russian tactics or lack, lacking tactics in Ukraine has been a kind of confirmation also for, for Finns and Swedes and what we already knew about Russian war tactics. They, they use power instead of brains, so to say, also with the risk to, to lose a lot of, of, of soldiers in the war. And this has shown that, that Russian is not an uh, impossible enemy. Uh, we know from, of course, from our own history in Finland, 80 years back, that, that the Russian used almost the same tactics at that time. So very few things have changed. So I think the, the fear of Russian uh, uh, power in war tactics has diminished because of the, the lack of Russian success in Ukraine. And that was partly also in the background when the Finnish public opinion and the political opinion started its transformation uh, during the spring. Johan, maybe you would also like to comment on this one. I, I think it's very important. The Ukrainians are fighting not only for themselves, but also for us and uh, trading uh, lives against time, you could say. So we have better to prepare ourselves for the coming years. After, the, as I said, my assessment is the security situation today in a couple of years uh, throughout this good, but uh, you never know what will happen after that. We never know what will happen uh, in, in the Russian political system, depending on what's happening in the end in Ukraine. 
And Niklas, do you also have a, have a view on this? Well, I, I, I think uh, I agree with what has been, been said uh, earlier. Uh, I think this shift, when it has now come to Sweden, uh, uh, it, it, it really opens up many possibilities. And I, I, I uh, see that from the military side, uh, as Johan said, they have been very clear now that uh, they are rapidly moving into uh, all those structures that, that NATO belong to. Mm. Um, next question here is, uh, there seems to be a somewhat broad political backing of the decision to join uh, NATO in both Finland and Sweden, with strong arguments being the increased defense cooperation and Swedish-Finnish unity. But going forward, what would you say are the largest risks and negatives from a foreign policy perspective for Sweden and Finland joining NATO? So what kind of risks are there uh, in, in the countries joining NATO uh, foreign policy-wise? Um, Niklas, maybe you'd like to start with this one. Sorry, once again. So uh, the question is about what kind of uh, risks are there uh, if Sweden and Finland are to join NATO? There's a broad political backing, uh, but what kind of risks could there be from a foreign policy perspective? If, if the two countries were to join? I think this has been the, the exactly that issue was the, the one that held uh, the Social Democrats back. They were afraid of, uh, will this weaken our, our voice in other, in other situations? And it has been a debate about, um, about it, but, but uh, in the end, kind of the, the position that Sweden has taken is that, okay, but if we look to, to Norway, they are a NATO country, but they still have a, a free voice and they can be very active in, in issues that, are, for example, for human rights. And they, if, if you remember, Norway ended up in a very troublesome situation when it comes to China because of the Nobel, Nobel Prize and other issues. And... Uh, I, th I think that in the end convinced uh, many Swedes and especially in the political community that, that yes, we can we can have a, a clear um, a, a clear position. What I think is a, de a debate that that is not easy. We have mentioned uh, uh, Turkey here before. That is in in essence what what I think Sweden now needs to to really uh, have a huge consideration for the future. How will we be able to, to take standpoints in this case when it comes to how, how, how Turkey has treated the Kurdish minority uh, being, being strong in that, but not then ending up having uh, problems with, with other countries? Because the, what we see now, I think it, this, this is exactly how how uh, difficult it is, even if uh, we move into NATO. I mean, you have several countries there that might not share Finland's and Sweden's views on, on, on a number of issues. They're both in, in uh, closer to us in Europe, but then, of course, Turkey. So I, I think that what, what exactly what we see now when it comes to Turkey is how, how the debate will be and how Sweden needs to, to shape the foreign policy in the future. Uh, it, it will be it will be more perspectives we have to consider. You had one debate since Sweden has a bilateral defense agreement with USA. You had a debate uh, between the former minister of, of foreign affairs Margot Wallström and the current minister of defense Peter Hultqvist. They they were in 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 uh, uh, not a public debate in that sense, but internally a tough decision on on <clears throat> Sweden's position when it comes to to, to new in nuclear um, and how we would then uh, have it, our views on on having a, a, a world free from nuclear weapons and that we should uh, we, we should uh, be strong in that position. We backed from that because it caused a problem with the Americans. So I, I think that Sweden has a mental uh, journey to do now of being this alliance-free, uh, open, always uh, on, on, on the forefront in, in issues. Uh, suddenly, we need to think another, another round if it's really um, 
possible for us to have those standpoints. So even if we looked on Norway, we also learn the tough way now with Turkey and, and earlier with America that uh, we need to consider positions because of our allies, what they think. Uh, Stefan, what do you think about this question, the, the risks of, uh, of Sweden and Finland joining NATO first, Stefan, and, and then uh, uh, you? Yeah, <clears throat> well, of course, there are always some kind of risks connected to international corporations. Always when you join a bigger club, there are some kind of, of risks, but you can't, you can't uh, avoid joining just because of that. And we have to remember that, that Finland and Sweden uh, have been partners, partners with NATO for since the mid, mid 90s. In that sense, this is, this is not a giant leap to join NATO. We have been training together. We have been uh, exchanging views and, and intelligence. <clears throat> we have NATO compatible material and standards. <clears throat> we, we know very much about each other. We have been participating in NATO operations, NATO led operations, three or four, I guess, from a Finnish point of view. That would not be a new issue for us either. And as uh, Niklas said, Norway and Denmark, our good Nordic friends, members of the Nordic family, they have been NATO members since a long time back, and they have been able to operate uh, very successfully on the international arena, also in peace building. Nobel Peace Prize is awarded in Oslo, so forth. So mm, I don't see too many too many risks risks here, uh, to, to be honest. But of course, uh, you should not be naive either. Uh, there are always risks connected to cooperation, as I said, but in practical terms, what happens when we join? The, the drama is as big as when, when a dash arm sits down. That's not too much. And you want? Well, I'm thinking about that uh, the, the risks are uh, the highest in the coming uh, next years in this process, in this bazaaring with President Erdogan. Uh, because there might be a conflict of interest, interest. Sweden and Finland has not the best negotiation position because we have stressed that we're, uh, we're doing this without delay, and etc. And that is concerns our security. So the, the Turks have a lot of uh, leverage in that regard. Uh, so that we be to balance then, so we don't have, we'll go into a conflict of interest where we sacrificed or eroding our interest for human rights, etc., uh, and switch that to security. So to try to balance that. And the other thing is that once we joined, which I think we will, uh, that we can overcome this mental thing that uh, uh, Nicholas alluded to earlier, uh, to uh, be clear what do we want to achieve within NATO, that we don't sit in the corner for for a couple of years just observing that we come into with a clear view of what we will achieve together in the Nordic realm and, and so on. Cool. Um, okay, now a slightly uh, different uh, question. What possible outcomes could you see in terms of international relations, politics and trade for Russia and Putin going forward if the war is stopped? So I guess this means uh, the war is stopped somehow uh, after the war. Uh, what is in the cause for Russia and uh, how, uh, how, how will that look like in terms of international relations, politics and trade? Who would like to go first? A difficult question. How about Niklas? Well, I, I am not an, an expert in that sense, but what I, what I can see when I listen to voices uh, I mean, the consensus is quite strong that it will take time because uh, Russia has now caused so much damage to, to the international uh, community and especially then to, to neighboring countries in Europe that uh, it will take time before you have a normalized uh, relation with Russia again. Uh, so that, that is what, uh, what I can see. And I think that the visit yesterday in Ukraine, as we all could see, from the large uh, countries in Europe, uh, even if there has been some debate uh, uh, and, and questions about uh, about it, I think they were very clear now that 
Ukraine needs to win. After that, we can start uh, discussion, but not not before. We need we need to have uh, back Ukraine now. Uh, yeah, I I agree yeah. very much on what what Nicholas said. Uh, <clears throat> Russia has played itself in a corner, uh, and is has it says itself to bl- to blame comes to the, the current situation and I think it, you could ask ask the question from your own the man in the middle what should what must happen if, if before Russia can be accepted again as a kind of well full member of the international community being in a situation when when it's isolate, isolated in all all fields economic sports culture diplomacy and so forth and I think the answer to that question is that it's impossible to see Russia uh, as a part of part of, of international cooperation as, as, as it used to be under the current leadership. So Putin must go or be removed before this process can start. I think that's that's quite obvious. Yes. Um, Johan, would you like to comment on that? I think one important factor is is how this uh, war then ends, under which terms. Um, are the Russians strategic defeated or are the Ukrainians exhausted? Uh, and Russia claims the Donbass. So that will decide the room of maneuver for Putin and, and his fellows. Uh, and so there's a very a lot of uh, alternatives that could happen from very dark one to a little bit positive side, but I think it will take a decade at least to uh, improve relations. Mm. Okay, next question. Um, I think we are sort of closing into the end of the webinar, but we we have time for a quick few more. Do the speakers see any chance of bringing both Russia and Ukraine into EU and NATO? I understand uh, war is very polarizing, but all of our unifying organizations have their origins in war. So would this kind of scenario ever be be possible? I think Boris Yeltsin once or twice said <clears throat> as president of Russia that Russia could uh, eventually join at least EU, maybe also NATO, but we don't know if he was sober or not when he said that, so maybe it's just theory. For now, it's very impossible to see a development like that. Yes. Um... And uh, how strong is the agreement between Kristesson and Magdalena Andersson not to play political football with the NATO application? Niklas, maybe you could take this one. Well, I, I, I assume this question is raised by either someone that hasn't been in Sweden the last two weeks or <laughs> uh, is ironic because I think uh, th- it was a very strong uh, strong uh, message they sent when 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 the prime minister invited the the leader of the opposition to be together with her at the press conference when this uh, this uh, issue was clear that we're applying for NATO, NATO membership and they stood there strong i think that sent a very good message but then the last weeks have been a total mess in parliament it's like it's like they have fever all of them um, I wrote in my newsletter that was published yesterday that you can find and, and via via M- Milton and so on uh, about this issue. I think they 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 lost also a lot of the public support here because they are now just playing playing the political game because the election is in the beginning of September. So they they really don't. To see clear any longer so it's like they have uh, election fever and and they can't really resist themselves to to uh, to um, uh, just get into battles whatever it is about so i hope that when the election is over and the fever has come down uh, they can b- get back on track again between the the large parties because that is absolutely necessary so uh, the last week hasn't really shown a, a good view of of respect for a process. They were totally up into internal uh, domestic debates, in, in, not even in issues that the voters feel especially involved in. It's only within this political community. 
All right, let's uh, um, uh, finish with a question to uh, Johan. I think this is it's a good one for you. Could you give your view on the effect uh, of the on the stability in Europe when Finland and Sweden join NATO? So what, how could that affect the stability in Europe? Most probably would be a very positive uh, effect on the stability in the Northern Europe region, uh, especially now when uh, Russia is occupied in uh, in Ukraine with its forces. So that uh, means that it will uh, we will have some time to establish that stability. Uh, so that's um, very very positive. And, but with then one remark then that we cannot foresee what they are thinking in the Kremlin. Uh, but that is not Sweden and Finland bringing uh, instability. That is Russia causing that, of course. Right. Okay. So we only have a few minutes left. A big thanks to all our speakers for your presentations and insightful answers. Um, lots of takeaways from this morning. Sweden and Finland are security political twins. That's something... I, I will remember, uh, and also the, the very good security situation, despite the, uh, the recent changes, of course, uh, in, in uh, Europe and Russia and, and Ukraine. Uh, and uh, also such an, uh, an interesting uh, summer and autumn ahead of us with both elections in Sweden and, and uh, keeping an eye on uh, these negotiations for the countries to join NATO, of course. Uh, thanks for myself, uh, for the speakers and the audience joining today. I'll now uh, give the word over to Peter for some final words. Thank you, uh, Elna. These are very hot topics. And for those of you who are not based in London, I can tell you that it's going to be 33 degrees today. So it's very hot here as well, as ho uh, hotter than Sahara, apparently, according to the BBC. Uh, thank you very much, Elna, for, for moderating today's session. Thanks to all our fantastic speakers. And thanks to all of you for joining us from across Europe uh, to tune into this conversation, which I very much like Elna said, will probably continue uh, and be a hot topic leading up to uh, at least Sweden's general election in September as well. Uh, have a fantastic rest of your day and have a great weekend when you get to that. Thank you. Thank you all.